Hello everyone, welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Today we have an amazing array of models to share with you from uh, Convair in San Diego at their factory model shop. Uh, we're going to talk about the entire family of Convair Delta fighters. But I'm holding in my hand a very rare, one-of-a-kind factory model of the MX-1554. And this was the concept uh, that was the bridge between the XF-92 experimental fighter and ultimately the F-102 and F-106 interceptors. But I'd like to take a moment to talk about collectible models in the sense that you notice this may not be the most pristine model. I'm going to turn it here so you can see the uh, bent tail and the discoloration. On the underside you've got some staining and discoloration as well. So from a cosmetic standpoint uh, this is uh, uh, not considered a, a perfect specimen but from a historical rarity standpoint, uh, this is indescribable in terms of its collectible value. Uh, the airplane was uh, never built in this configuration, but the model conveys in three dimensions uh, what this uh, middle step would have looked like. And if you notice, the uh, exhaust cap looks uh, similar to the cars of that era with the uh, uh, afterburner tail type uh, design. And the beginnings of the F-102 cockpit and air intake uh, configuration that you see here. So, uh, in terms of collectability, sometimes the prettiest models are not the most valuable, uh, but this is a, uh, an amazing piece of Convair history and aviation history. And now let's talk a little bit about the entire family of Convair Delta airplanes. We're going to begin our discussion of the Convair Delta family with the great-grandfather of the series, the experimental XF-92. This is a one-of-a-kind airplane that uh, first flew in 1948 and this set the stage for all the other Delta Wing airplanes that came after. Uh, just in a quick review, we have the XF-92 here. Behind it is the YF-102. Uh, this was the uh, attempt to take the concept to a production airplane. It had a barrel fuselage. It was unable to go supersonic. And so the next step was the F-102. And this had some changes to the configuration, which we'll talk about, uh, which allowed it to achieve supersonic speed. Here we have the Sea Dart. This is the world's first and only supersonic seaplane. That uh, was an amazing concept. Uh, the idea basically was to put an F-102 on water skis and make it an uh, uh, ocean-based airplane that could operate from uh, submarines. We'll come back and talk about that as well. Next we have the two-seat uh, TF-102. This was an airplane that was used in Vietnam. Uh, it was affectionately referred to as the Tub, but it was a two-seat 102. Uh, the uh, F-102 with the taller tail, you'll notice compared to the earlier version, this had a full production F-102 tail, and I might mention there were a thousand F-102s uh, that were built total, 111 being the two-seat trainer. And uh, bringing up the rear, the F-106, uh, the world's uh, ultimate interceptor, uh, beloved by anybody that flew it, and uh, the world's fastest single-engine, single-seat aircraft to this day. We've talked about the XF-92 before, but I wanted to take a moment to uh, bring a few other points uh, into the conversation. The XF-92 was a one-of-a-kind airplane. Uh, first flew on the one-year anniversary of the United States Air Force on 18 September 1948. I'd like to take a moment to talk about where the whole Delta concept came from and how Convair was able to capitalize on it. In the 1940s, Alexander Lippisch in Germany had developed the concept of the 60-degree sweep isosceles triangle lifting surface and they realized that this was a very uh, high speed, high, high performance configuration. Lippisch was brought to the United States at the end of the war, uh, wound up at Wright Field, and the Convair engineers were able to, as I said, capitalize on his uh, development work, and that uh, created the XF-92. Uh, as I might have mentioned before, the uh, single airplane constructed is uh, on display today at the National Museum of the Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. The next member of the Convair Delta family is the YF-102. This is a very significant airplane and the reason is that it was designated the WS-201A. WS stood for weapon system. What that meant is that this was a replacement for the F-86D Sabre, uh, the F-89 Scorpion, the F-94 Starfire. That generation of interceptor involved uh, smaller rockets and a, a radar operator in the back seat. The 102 concept was going to create a weapon system that would have a uh, high-powered radar, uh, a fire control system for missiles that would be carried internally, and this created a whole new generation of uh, interceptor. So let's take a look at the model, and you notice that uh, it's got the beautiful lines, it's evolving toward the F-102, 
but as I turn it toward the camera, look at the fuselage. It's a barrel-shaped fuselage. And this was a problem. This uh, prevented the airplane from going supersonic other than in a dive. And uh, this was below the requirement of what the Air Force was asking for. So uh, we're going to look at a later airplane and see how they solved that problem uh, that was inherent in the YF-102. I'm holding in my hands a stunning Convair factory model of the production F-102A. This is the breakthrough. Uh, as I turn the airplane toward the camera, you notice that the fuselage has a uh, different shape than the YF-102, and this is called the Coke bottle fuselage, or the wasp waist fuselage. What this is, is the area rule uh, design that was first discovered by aerodynamicist Richard Whitcomb in 1952. And what this basically said is that as the uh, frontal area uh, increases on the airplane, uh, that the fuselage shape decreases to compensate for that. So where you see the wing on the F-102, you notice that the fuselage gets pinched uh, in the area where the engine is housed, and that compensates for the area of uh, the frontal area of the wing. This allows the airplane to go supersonic, and this was uh, in vogue on any number of airplanes uh, of this era, from the uh, Grumman F-11F, the Republic F-105, they all had this uh, aerial rule fuselage which allowed uh, very high performance. Uh, and you notice now that the uh, engine exhaust area, uh, the cockpit area, air intakes are uh, quite a bit more evolved than the original uh, YF-102. You have some uh, spanwise flow wing fences on the leading edges of the wing that you can see here. And um, uh, this really uh, was the ultimate evolution of the original 1954 interceptor concept. Uh, it carried uh, Hughes Falcon radar-guided missiles on internal weapon bays underneath the forward wing. First flight was December 20th, 1954. For all you Steve Canyon fans, this was his favorite airplane. And so now we have Convair firmly in the uh, jet interceptor business with the F-102 Delta Dagger. The TF-102 side-by-side -side configuration version of the F-102 Delta Dagger was a unique airplane. Of the 1,000 F-102s built, 111 were TF-102s. These airplanes were used in Vietnam and were really an effective uh, trainer for high-performance uh, interceptors. The airplane had a, an advanced fire control system and was fully uh, capable of carrying the full array of armament of Hughes uh, Falcon missiles. It was an amazing airplane. It was affectionately referred to as the tub but uh, it did the job and it was a very effective airplane. For me personally, uh, I knew a pilot when I was flying gliders out at uh, Elsinore, who uh, was a right seater in the F-102 and loved the airplane. Said it was a very effective system and uh, flew it in Vietnam and really got the mission done. An amazing airplane. This version of the F-102 Delta Dagger has a taller vertical fin. This was a modification. Uh, as with many other airplanes of this era, uh, the initial uh, vertical fin area was uh, deemed as uh, being just too small for uh, the control authority of the supersonic performance of the airplane. So much like the F-100, Douglas Skyrocket, uh, other airplanes that had their vertical fin area increased, the 102 had uh, its fin area increased, as you see uh, compared to the earlier version of the production 102 uh, behind me. And uh, it's an interesting comparison and a refinement of an already uh, very good design. The final member of the Convair Delta Wing family is considered the ultimate interceptor, the F-106 Delta Dart. This first flew in December of 1956, and it has some differences from the F-102. Primarily, the air intake is located after the cockpit. It's a longer forward fuselage section. A uh, slightly different delta wing configuration with cambered uh, leading edge and wing tip. It has a square tip on the tail fin versus the vertical. Uh, very distinctive speed brakes and this beautiful chrome ring uh, exhaust of the J-75, the Pratt & Whitney engine that was capable of 25,000 pounds of thrust in full burner. That same engine was used in Republic's F-105, uh, but this airplane was 12,000 pounds lighter than the 105 and it gave it uh, just amazing performance. The 106 has the distinction of setting a world record in December of 1959. Uh, the airplane achieved Mach 2.41 on one of the uh, two passes to create the ultimate speed record and that made it the fastest single engine jet airplane in the world. It carried any number of uh, missiles including the nuclear-tipped uh, Douglas Genie, and it was just considered by anyone who flew it the Cadillac of uh, interceptors, as they said back in those days. Uh, it was an amazing airplane, uh, and it wasn't until the new generation of uh, F-15, F-16 type aircraft that this performance of this airplane was superseded. 
As you may know, Consolidated Vol-T had a tremendous amount of experience with flying boats in World War II uh, with such uh, legendary aircraft as the PBY Catalina. And they chose to use that experience with a jet-powered seaplane. The British had the first jet seaplane in 1947, the Saunders Row uh, A-1. But Convair decided to capitalize on the development of the F-102 and so they uh, parlayed that uh, design experience into the uh, XF-2Y-1 Sea Dart. The airplane was first flown in 1954. Convair test pilot Sam Shannon took off from uh, San Diego Bay. It was a rough ride. Any of the pilots that flew the Sea Dart said it was just a bone jarring ride on the water. It started out with twin water ski type landing gear and eventually went to a single mono ski configuration. Uh, it was powered by two J46 Westinghouse turbojets uh, which put out about 6,000 pounds of thrust each and uh, the airplane achieved supersonic speed in a slight dive and became the world's first supersonic seaplane. Uh, four were built, two were flown, uh, one unfortunately was lost in an accident uh, when uh, Charles Richburg uh, uh, was making a low pass during a public demonstration in San Diego and the airplane went into a very divergent pitch oscillation and uh, unfortunately disintegrated in, in a, uh, a fatal accident. But uh, the surviving airplanes are uh, located at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, the San Diego Air and Space Museum, the Naval Air Station Willow Grove, and uh, you can see these airplanes if you're in any of those cities. It was an aesthetically beautiful machine, as you see here, very elegant lines, and the 60 degree sweep of the uh, Delta Wing uh, gave it a very futuristic look and very uh, outstanding performance in the air. The problem was integrating a high-performance jet airplane into a waterborne seaplane. And although this was designed to be serviced by submarines anywhere around the world, when you added in the capability of modern aircraft carriers, this concept suddenly became obsolete, and the Convair Sea Dart never saw production. So there you have it, the complete look at the Convair Delta family of fighters. I certainly hope you've enjoyed this look at uh, some really amazing factory models and an amazing piece of aviation history. We thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. And until next time, take care.